Hi, I'm Deanna Jo, and welcome to my channel, Responsible Faith. Since I started this channel, um, people have been curious about my story. And, you know, there's something unnerving about just giving people a peek into your personal life, especially when you're a private person. Um, I did decide to share with the hopes that it might comfort anyone who has dealt with similar situations and that maybe you won't feel alone. Like everybody, my story involves other people, and so that makes it more complicated to tell. I can't speak to others' um, motives or intent. All I can do is share what happened and how it made me feel. Um, I don't want to hurt anyone. That's actually the opposite of what I'm trying to do here. There are major details that I will be leaving out entirely, just for the sake of my own peace. And so this is not my whole story. In fact, a lot of the most difficult things I've gone through, I've actually left out. So I am an only child. I was born and raised on a small hobby farm in Eastern Canada. And our family attended the local United Pentecostal Church. I put my faith in Christ as a little girl to the best of my understanding. So I attended elementary school wearing my little UPC uniform, um, the little skirts, and actually my mom did wear uh, gym clothes on me. I had a fabulous little 80s pink matching uh, tracksuit that I wore for gym. And I can remember feeling normal in gym class, you know, sort of like all the other kids. My parents had a lot of friends in the church when I was a kid, many of them with kids my own age. And so uh, our parents would visit back and forth and we would all get to uh, hang out together and play and stuff. And so that was a lot of fun. I have a lot of great memories of that. I got baptized when I was 12 years old and uh, I wasn't actually allowed to be baptized as a child. I can remember when groups of little kids would get baptized and mom would always say no. <laughs> Uh, she just felt like I should be old enough to know what I was doing and to properly understand it. Um, she didn't, she wanted me to take it seriously. And in hindsight, I actually agree a hundred percent with that. And I'm glad that she held out for that, but, um, she thought I should wait until I had spoken in tongues before I got baptized. And that's just, uh, a topic that her and I'll have to agree to disagree on. But um, unfortunately, she didn't realize the fear I carried in my heart that I might go to hell. Um, as a little girl, I can remember having a hard time sleeping. I was afraid of the devil and demons and missing the rapture and being left behind because, you know, I wasn't baptized. I hadn't spoken in tongues. Maybe I had, you know, sassed my parents or, or disobeyed or something. And, you know, I... I was also afraid of having my head chopped off for not denying Christ and taking the mark of the beast in the tribulation. So <laughs> um, there's an illustrated uh, search for truth Bible study chair out there that is responsible for traumatizing many of us UPC kids back in the day. And those are heavy thoughts for a little girl. When I told mom a few years ago, she actually felt bad because she had no idea and wished I had told her because she could have put my fears to rest. Sometimes in the Christian community, we don't give enough thought to what children are hearing and how it might affect them and whether they even have the ability to understand some concepts or not. And it's terrorized a lot of kids over the years. I hear from people all the time with similar stories and I had no idea that it was so common. When I was 12, I finally spoke in tongues, which is a big deal in the United Pentecostal Church. They call it receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I can remember that night was an exhausting ordeal. Um, I was relieved when I had finally received because now I didn't have to worry anymore. You know, I could get baptized. I would have you know, jumped all the hoops, all my bases would be covered, and I could be fully saved and know for sure I was ready to die at 12. <laughs> um, often, well-meaning people would gather around um, the person seeking the Holy Ghost at the front or the altar and would help pray them through. These are all like phraseologies within that uh, particular organization. 
and that made it difficult to politely go back to your seat if you wanted to. Um, so they would pray and cry and hold your arms up in worship because at some point, you know, you were too tired to do it anymore on your own. And there are people who crack under the pressure <laughs> and admit later that they just faked it to make people happy and to get people to back off and let them leave and go sit down. Now that wasn't my case, but it's more common than you think. So you're hot and you're tired and you're crying and people are praying hard and speaking in tongues loudly all around you and encouraging you to speak in tongues. And um, you know, it's an incredibly emotional, intense situation. And when you finally do, everyone rejoices. So, you know, it's a joyous thing, but it's also a lot of pressure. And I've even, with the best of intentions, participated in several situations like this myself over the years where, you know, I just thinking that this was how it was done, I was trying to help people receive. And you know, hindsight is 2020. I actually look back on that with a lot of regret. The Holy Spirit does not need my help to work in people's lives. And I think in an intense environment like that, there's also a danger in mistaking an emotional experience for the Holy Spirit. You know, an emotional experience that can be drummed up by all the crying and singing and shouting and praying and, you know, loud music and stuff. And so now as a teen, I was allowed to uh, trim my hair. Um, you know, to keep it healthy. I think I even had bangs a couple of times. I don't remember uncut hair being such a huge thing in our district, just long. But that was back when the UPC was a bit more balanced and had moderate ministers. And many of them were squeezed out in the 90s. By junior high, I only wore skirts, even for gym class. And, you know, nothing sleeveless, super, super high necklines, no makeup. My mother did allow me to wear a necklace, so I was luckier than some. And I could get away with clear nail polish. By high school, it didn't make sense to me that the God of the universe would, by my assessment, you know, overlook all of this other stuff, horrible things that were going on, and focus in on silly things like my sleeve length or a woman wearing pants. Having been touched by the story of the gospel, um, and having fallen in love with Jesus, I just, I needed to know what the Bible said and what it didn't say. And when I looked up the verses they use for many of these rules, I found they didn't really prohibit these things. So I convinced my mom to let me wear proper gym clothes. And I discovered that I loved uh, volleyball and softball and I enjoyed gym class, you know, who knew? <laughs> so the UPC Articles of Faith say that they disapprove of their people indulging in any activities which are not conducive to good Christianity and godly living. And it, they list all worldly sports and amusements. So we were not allowed to play on organized sports teams at school. Um, my gym teacher actually tried to encourage me towards the two sports that I enjoyed because she coached both teams and had even offered to call home and explain, you know, that things were supervised and stuff. But, you know, it was a waste of time. I had already asked and the answer was no. And so I just told her, I said, you know, don't bother. <laughs> but it was disappointing. You know, I would have loved to have played team sports. I think it would have helped my self-esteem at that age. And I probably wouldn't have hated school as bad as I did because I wouldn't have felt like such an outsider. The youth from our church started playing pickup softball at a local ball field that was rarely used. Uh, no doubt we were all missing out on being able to play organized sports. And um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, that was, those are some sweet memories I look back on. It was allowed because it didn't interfere with our church attendance. <laughs> twice on Sunday, Bible study on Tuesday night, youth prayer meeting on Wednesday night, youth service on Friday night, and adult prayer meeting on Saturday night, which my parents went to quite often. So, you know, church attendance consumed our lives. And when I was younger, I loved it. As I aged and developed some interest, <laughs> um, maybe less so, it interfered with having a life. 
I also made a case to my mother, I made the modesty case, uh, for wearing shorts playing, long shorts playing softball. And she agreed. And lest you think I'm referring to Daisy Duke shorts here, <laughs> you'd have to know my mother and the styles of the early 90s. They were loose fitting and knee length. Um, so even though my parents allowed it, it still ended up getting me in trouble. Um, I wasn't the only one from my youth group wearing shorts. I wasn't even the only one wearing them who asked for a recommendation letter for Bible college that year. But I was the only one who got in trouble. The fall of my senior year, I decided that I was going to apply to Bible college and that that's what I wanted to do. And so I needed a recommendation letter from my pastor and then two other uh, recommendation letters to be accepted, which I never thought would be a problem. But as it turns out, it was a problem. Uh, one Sunday morning in October, I was called into my pastor's office and confronted before church without my parents present. They were actually just sitting like 20 feet away in the sanctuary waiting for church to start. And my pastor seemed angry and told me he would not be giving me a pastoral recommendation for Bible college because, and I quote, <laughs> uh, I've seen parents try to send their kids to Bible school with the hopes that it will straighten them out and it never works. I was shocked. I wasn't doing anything wrong or sinful. I was a good kid. You know, there was nothing to straighten out. So like, I have no idea what prompted the anger at the time. It seemed uncharacteristic for him. But needless to say, it was very intimidating and it blindsided me. You know, to my knowledge, I'd always been considered a good Christian girl in that church and was fairly well respected. So looking back, I don't know if someone was making trouble behind the scenes or if it was just a matter of the dress standards. Um, I can't remember everything he said in the meeting, but he did mention my shorts at one point. And so I remember sitting there with my stomach in knots not knowing what to say or do. I think the only thing I said was that I hadn't worn shorts since summer and once I decided to go to Bible college, like I didn't and I wouldn't be anymore. Um, and I mean, we had a year ahead of us, but um, it didn't change his mind. Um, there wasn't even a, well, okay, we'll wait and see then. It was nothing, it was just a solid no. And I couldn't actually go to any Bible college without a recommendation from my pastor. So that pretty much put an end to that. Um, I left his office shocked and returned to my seat in the sanctuary where my friend was anxiously waiting for me to come back to see what was going on. Um, her sister, in an effort to secure the church for her upcoming spring wedding, had actually come back and saw the door closed and overheard him raising his voice at somebody. And so she quickly came back out to the sanctuary to wait. And when she told her sister what she'd overheard, she said, someone's in trouble. <laughs> well, then they realized it was me. Um, I just turned 17 and I was young and unsure of myself with adults and especially an authority figure. Fortunately, I had established a long track record of being honest with my parents. So when I got, when we got home from church that morning and I told them what happened, that they believed me. So I'm very thankful for that. But they were shocked and I think they had just hoped that maybe it was a byproduct of a bad day on his part. You know, this was a church we'd actively attended my entire life. My parents held several positions there. Our friends were all there. I mean, this was our community. Unfortunately, it didn't blow over. We had weekly youth prayer meetings. We'd sometimes pray downstairs in the Sunday school classrooms and the guys would all pray together in one. And because not many girls came to youth prayer, it was often just me in a different classroom by myself, which suited me just fine. I actually enjoyed the privacy. So they kept all the lights on in the main auditorium and the classroom doors open and we often just left the classroom lights off because i mean they all had a window and um, the light shining in from the auditorium and i used to be teased that my room was the baptist prayer room because i was pretty quiet and theirs was the pentecostal one so i often had to remind them that god's not hard of hearing and so i didn't feel the need to yell at them um Within a few weeks of my meeting with the pastor, he uncharacteristically showed up at youth prayer meeting and stood outside the Sunday school classroom where I was praying by myself. 
I remember seeing the outline of his shadow on the wall and hearing him out there breathing and he was just standing there and I didn't know what to do. Um, he stood there listening for several minutes. I have no idea what he was listening for or what he thought he was going to hear, but I stood there frozen, you know, afraid to move, afraid he was going to come in. Like I just, I didn't know what was going on and it was very stressful. <laughs> um, it bothered me, but I tried to push it out of my mind, just, I don't know, thinking maybe it was nothing. And then it happened again. Um, at that point, I started feeling uncomfortable attending youth prayer, which was something I had faithfully done for a long time. Then, on a Bible study night in the middle of song service, I went to the washroom via the back stairs. And immediately, when I got up and started out, he got up from the platform uh, in the middle of song service and went down the front stairs. So that kind of freaked me out a bit <laughs> at this point. And, but I just kept thinking, well, I'm just being paranoid. But I could hear him out in the auditorium of the basement while I was in the washroom. And I was worried he was waiting to confront me again. So my stomach was in knots. Um, I waited a few minutes until I heard him walk away before I felt like I could come out. And thanks to his heavy footsteps and an old church with creaky floors, you know, I could listen and hear him go like his footsteps walk away. Um, a guy friend of mine had noticed and thought it was weird. And he knew everything that was going on and that I'd started battling anxiety at church. So a few weeks later, it happened again, exactly the same way. And that time, my friend got up and followed him, the pastor, just right on his heels, right across the front and downstairs. But this time, instead of waiting around, he just basically went down the stairs, kept going through the auditorium, up the back stairs, and back up onto the platform again. So I have no idea what, what all that was about. Um, but I can tell you, <laughs> at this point, I didn't feel comfortable going to youth prayer anymore, and I didn't feel comfortable going to the washroom at church anymore. And so I was starting to feel watched and followed. Things had changed, you know, I was being treated differently, and I had no clue why. A while later, a friend from the youth group called to tell me that the pastor had dropped in to talk to her parents privately, and that she and her sister had been sent to their room. And, which, of course, would pique any good teenager's curiosity to the point where they would do the rest to eavesdrop. And she called to tell me that he was currently sitting in their living room saying a bunch of negative things about me and how I was a bad influence to her parents. And she was very upset about it and just thought I should know. So, I mean, I didn't even know how to process that. From then on, her father did not want her or her sister to hang out with me anymore. And I heard back that the pastor had actually talked to other people about me as well. So after dealing with this for about three or four months, I started feeling anxious and sick right before church. And from the time I was a little girl, I always had a sensitive stomach and would get stomach pains if I was nervous or stressed about something. And so as you can imagine, this situation began to affect my health. I started missing church because I was too sick to go. And then overnight, my health problems just seemed to take on a life of their own. Uh, every single thing I ate seemed to hurt my stomach. I, I had bad stomach pains all the time, stress or no stress. And I started missing school. And I used to actually joke about it, you know, like make it seem like I was just skipping because why would you go to school on such a beautiful day? You know, that kind of thing. But I've always used humor to cope and deflect. The reality was I was scared. I was very sick all the time. And um, I really didn't want anybody to know because we didn't know what it was at that point. So, I mean, I did a lot of praying at that time that God would help me with my health. So by spring, <laughs> my health was shot. And I felt like an outsider in the only community I'd ever been allowed to be a part of. You know, the UPC has so many unique rules and they celebrate their separation from the world as well as the church attendance occupying, you know, a great deal of your free time that it produced a very tight knit community um, of fellowship, which can seem like a good idea at the time until... <laughs> 
you uh, you have a problem. And then you see how unhealthy it can be to have this exclusive us versus them mentality because when you're not an us anymore um, and you get pushed to the fringe, it's very eye-opening. My anxiety was through the roof and I was sick almost every Sunday. Actually, I would start getting sick Saturday night in anticipation of church on Sunday. And I missed 32 days of school my senior year of high school. Um, I had frequent doctor's appointments and tests and I was trying to, you know, they were just trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I can actually remember uh, my school had this rule that you could, if you missed more than 30 days, you couldn't graduate. And so I was stressed out because I didn't want to not graduate. So I met with the principal and I can just remember her, she laughed and she was like, uh, Deanna, you know, you're a good student. You know, this rule was not made for people like you. <laughs> so don't worry about it. So, I mean, that eased my mind a little bit um but i couldn't seem to stop the spiral my health was taking um finally i was diagnosed with a gastrointestinal disorder that my doctor suggested was likely triggered and made worse by a traumatic experience and the ongoing stress i was dealing with so my parents were very upset watching my health implode at 17 and uh, we agreed i needed to leave that church um, so I went to a liberal UPC church in our community about 10 minutes away and within a few months my parents followed. Um, my old church viewed that church as not having the truth, weak on the message, and they were accused by some of not believing anything. Um, I don't know how you not believe anything, but... And upon arrival we actually realized that it was a loving church and, um kind of served somewhat as a hospital for all the wounded UPCers in the surrounding area. Um, I'd examined the dress standards and at this point, like I didn't believe them to be scriptural. I also didn't believe that you needed to speak in tongues to be saved. I was starting to better understand the grace of God and I had looked into the Godhead um, and that <laughs> was a result of a guy, the guy friend I mentioned earlier he had gone to Bible college and he was all excited about what he was learning about the oneness and he would come home and tell me. And so, of course, because I love to torment, I decided I was going to study all the opposing uh, verses and debate with him the next time he come home, the Trinitarian standpoint. Well, the joke was on me because, uh, yeah, I found out the Trinitarians had a lot more scriptures than I thought they did. And so... While I still leaned oneness at the time, I definitely came away with a lot of verses that I did not know what to do with. I was also about to have my eyes open to the way things work when you fall out of favor um, and how shallow and conditional many of the relationships within the church are. I was pretty naive and young, you know. I thought we'd just leave and maintain the peace and that I could keep my friends and that people would still respect my parents and be nice to them, to them. but uh, that's not how it went. One month, my parents were considered pillars in the church and the next we were lepers and not one thing had changed except where we sat on Sundays. Some of the saints were still friendly and nice, but many who met us in public looked at us like we were guilty of some terrible thing and <laughs> tried to avoid us. And I can remember meeting face to face with adults I'd known my whole life at the grocery store and smiling and saying hello, only to have them turn their head and not speak and just leave me standing there. It was shocking and crushing for a kid my age. And sadly, that wasn't just an isolated incident. You know, shunning is real. You know, you become invisible. It's hard for church members to imagine because you don't actually see that side of things until you fall out of favor or leave. And so, you know, it's easy to say, oh, our church isn't like that. If you're still there and you've never left, you don't really know what your church is like. We heard gossip about us and people said some pretty rude things, even though they didn't have a clue what had happened. And it became stressful and awkward to meet up with people from that church, which happened quite often because we lived in a pretty small town, because you never knew how they were going to react. It made the narrative that the church is one big family, the family of God, almost a sickening idea. <laughs> Many of my parents' friends just faded off the scene. 
And I think only one person from that church ever reached out to my father and told him that they missed us. But nobody ever asked what happened, <laughs> you know. And that had nothing to do with people having good manners. We lived in a small town where, you know, people just ask. So the few people I tried to tell just seemed uncomfortable. They didn't want to hear it, you know. You don't say anything about leadership, even if it's true. And I was angry. I, I was just trying to explain why I had to leave my tight-knit community that had been my whole life for 17 years. And it just felt like nobody cared. My parents' exit freed up leadership positions, much to people's delight. And we found that opportunity does, in fact, control people's loyalty in, in way too many cases. And that's something that has been confirmed to me over the years in my church experiences time and time again. I'm telling you, it can be a cutthroat world. <laughs> the world of church positions. Mike Rinder says, the difference between a religion and a cult is what happens when you leave. Churches often don't realize that it's their methods of control and the shunning that make them cultish, not necessarily their teachings. A denomination can have both cultic and non-cultic uh, churches within their fellowship, I think, and it has a lot to do with the health of the church and the leadership. We reestablished ourselves at the new church, and um, but by then I had major trust issues. You know, it's not a good thing to become cynical at 17. And I kept some of my friends, and I lost some of them, and in fact, some of them weren't even allowed to hang out with me anymore. And my health was still an ongoing battle. On the upside, at the new church, I could wear makeup and jewelry and pants and not have to worry about getting in trouble. And, and that was one nice thing, you know, just being a normal young woman. So it was, it was nice. I remember feeling completely worn out at 18, you know, from, from my health issues as well as all the drama I had been through. And I wondered if I would ever have a normal life. Um, I was accepted into a youth missions program, not UPC, and I had my plane ticket all bought, but you know, by the time it was time to leave, I was just too sick to go. So while everyone I graduated with went off to college and started work that fall, I stayed home trying to figure out how I was going to manage my health. After a few very rough years, my health was a bit more manageable and I started thinking about my future again. You know, I still wanted to minister and help people. And honestly, I, I have no idea why I ever considered um, a UPC Bible college, uh, except that it was close by and my health was still an ongoing issue. But I was so desperate to get on with my life and just do something. So I reapplied and my pastor at, at the new church, he wrote my recommendation letter. So I had dated in the past, uh, nothing serious. Um, but that spring I had my first boyfriend that I really cared about. And, um, I was 19 and he wasn't UPC, but he was a strong Christian and the pastor of his church <laughs> didn't want him dating me. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think the fact that I came from a UPC background came into play and conjured up a spiritual dream where if we stayed together, I would destroy his life. So being young and having, you know, all my previous baggage of being judged as toxic and a bad influence, I worried that it might be true. And so we broke up right before I went to Bible college and, you know... That was my first broken heart. So I went to Bible college for one semester and I hated it every day I was there. I mean, I, I made friends and I had some fun, but I didn't belong. And I started dating a guy right off the bat who also hated it there, which was likely what caused us to gravitate to one another. And we got way too serious, way too fast. And in hindsight, I realized I was on the rebound but, you know, I didn't think of that at the time. And so we spent every waking moment together and we were talking about getting married that upcoming summer. Uh, we ended up becoming way too physically involved over Christmas. And I had always, ha I've always had a strong conscience. And I made the dumb mistake of, in my guilt-ridden condition, confiding in a woman 
on staff at the college and confessed that I had made a mistake and I had actually even had a scare <laughs> that month, but as it turned out, it was a false alarm. And so I was relieved and so was she, and I was so ashamed of myself, but you know, she actually seemed understanding and compassionate. And my boyfriend and I were more careful in an effort not to mess up again, but we did. So feeling like this was becoming an ongoing problem, we needed a solution and we didn't want to break up. So because of our guilt and our youth and our absolute stupidity, <laughs> we secretly eloped because that was the smart thing to do. Um, after dating for only about five months and, you know, it just seemed like a way to make things right and he wanted to marry me and my conscience was killing me, so we got married. Now, our genius plan was not to tell anyone and just finish the school year. You know, it would solve our guilt problem and then we'd have our wedding in the summer and everything would be fine. But remaining at the school with a hidden marriage felt dishonest. Uh, the rule was that you couldn't get married in your first year so. So we decided to leave and, you know, keeping in mind, we both hated it there anyway. Uh, so we set up a meeting to tell the principal we were leaving and had eloped. And he convinced us to wait the weekend until he talked to the board so we'd at least know what our options were. Even though we'd already decided to leave, we just figured, well, we'll wait and see what he says. So a few days later, he reported back to us that the board said we had to leave. Um, I've often wondered if that wasn't to save face. Uh, so it would look like the board dealt with us and kicked us out instead of the fact that we had just quit. <laughs> uh, but who knows? Gossip flew, as you can imagine, you know, quickie marriage. People always talk about them. And I remember thinking, well, I don't care. I mean, they'll be proven wrong soon enough. And then I found out in March that I was pregnant because I couldn't stop throwing up. <laughs> so... Uh, and my due date was roughly nine months from when we got married. So, you know, the calendars came out and the days were counted and I was looked over at every, uh, church event and sized up. Um, it was nice. And of course, thanks to Murphy's Law, I went into labor two weeks early. Um, the silver lining of that was I didn't end up with a nine pound baby that my obstetrician was expecting. But um, I got it was so that was a win, you know, in, in the middle of it all, at least there was one win. So I enjoyed the snide remarks and the judgmental looks. And, you know, it's it's not even like you can really defend yourself and say, well, you know, we didn't get married because I was pregnant because like the real reason we got married was nothing to brag about. So um, I actually had a UPC member of my husband's family pull me aside after we were married and encouraged me to consider abortion, which was just a matter of pride. Um, you know, and I, I've often wondered how many abortions the church actually causes with their harsh and sanctimonious treatment <clears throat> of young women who do decide to go through with pregnancies. And, you know, as a female, you wear that scarlet letter for a long time. People don't forget. And the guy involved, I mean... He's, he's not treated the same. I also heard the lady I had trusted and confided in back in college was confirming to people that, yes, I had told her before I left the school that I was pregnant. And uh, yeah, that wasn't true. Months later, we were invited to help out in a church. And I had my daughter while we lived there. And when she was born, we had her dedicated. And, you know, I hadn't wanted a baby dedication. You can see my views about that on, on my baby dedication video. But uh, it was important to some of our family members, and so we did. And that Sunday, we were not on the platform. We were stood down front where nobody in the congregation could see the baby, in front of the whole church and our family who had traveled for hours to be there. And I'm guessing because the assumption was that she'd been conceived out of wedlock, that the, vis the, the disapproval had to be made visible. It was pretty embarrassing. Oddly enough, at the time, my husband was allowed to sit on the platform and even speak uh, occasionally, but my daughter and I were not allowed up there for the dedication. It's interesting how that works. Actually, the sanctity of the platform has always interested me, and the things that 
are allowed for some people but then disqualify others. Double standards reign supreme in some churches where the rules for the average saints get bent for big tithers and the pastor's family and friends. Um, you know, those goalposts, they can be moved for the right people. So over a span of about three years, we helped out at churches. We were briefly youth pastors and we were interim pastors at another church, which actually they asked us to submit our name for the position. But the district presbyter was my old pastor from that first church. And um, he quickly appointed a pastor for them. So that was disappointing because we really cared about the people. Um, we evangelized around and my husband preached a few youth weeks, that kind of thing. But I was still a misfit. Um, I cared about people, but I didn't believe much of the UPC doctrine anymore, even though I kept that to myself. Um, the traveling around just highlighted the inconsistency and the hypocrisy of the rules, which seemed to differ from church to church and pastor to pastor. I remember one pastor had us stay at their house and take services for the weekend while they were away, and he was hard line on the dress standards. Um, but when I walked past their bedroom door, I saw this massive TV. <laughs> I mean, that was before flat screens. That's, that's back when, you know, lifting a 20-inch TV could give you a hernia, and this thing was huge, and I was kind of surprised. And then I saw that the cabinet had the door ajar a little bit and there was a stack of movies in there. And I just thought, oh my word, I cannot pass this up. So I snooped and he had a whole bunch of new releases. I mean, this went against the UPCI Articles of Faith and this recent Westberg resolution that they had just passed. And one of the movies was a new release at the time. I've never watched the movie, but I had heard of it because it was very controversial at the time. It's the movie Basic Instinct starring Sharon Stone. And if you have no clue what that is, you just head over to Wikipedia and look that baby up because <laughs> the description will let you know exactly what that movie was about. Um, I don't know. I guess the important thing was that his wife didn't cut her hair, wear a pair of pants. You know, because those are visual qualifiers. But, you know, all bets are off when you're home by yourself and nobody can see what you're doing. I, I don't know. I don't get it. How do you call that holiness? I also remember going to ministers' homes and them giving us a scoop on their church problems. I always hated that. Um, so if a visiting evangelist ever gets up and addresses something going on in your church and says the Lord showed him, there's a good chance that the Lord used his, your pastor to fill him in. Older ministers we knew encouraged us to be faithful, attend every conference and event. I mean, that was expensive for a young family to do. And to network and stay available for opportunities to preach, which ironically, I mean, they could have invited us to come preach at their churches, but many of them didn't. So they just meddled and advised my husband to keep crappy jobs instead of pursuing something more stable in an effort to stay available and to attend all these conferences and fellowships. And eventually, after getting turned down for his local license and watching preacher sons and son-in-laws get fast-tracked to the front of the line for opportunities, I think he realized he was wasting his time and sick of barely scraping by and chasing the proverbial carrot on the stick, we moved back to my hometown and he took a job long haul truck driving. So he was gone and I was home and stuck attending the same UPC church that had turned their back on me as a teen with the same pastor. <laughs> And I was miserable and my health flared up again. Not that it had ever, uh, the problems had ever gone away. Actually, it's been a very limiting um, factor in my life. But at times it was more manageable and less manageable and it became very difficult to manage at that time. Eventually, I shed the dress standards and just decided to live a normal life. And immediately, people started gossiping that, well, yeah, see there, she's the reason that he couldn't make it in the ministry. So, of course. In time, life unfolded, and I could no longer stay married to my husband, and I knew divorce was inevitable. And I can remember sitting in a service um, towards the back of the church and just kind of scanning the room and looking around and thinking, 
you know, I've got all this chaos going on in my life that nobody knows about. Um, and I remembered how I'd been treated before and thinking this is going to be hard and people are going to be judging me and gossiping and there is no way I'm going to do this here. Just no way. So I left the church and filed for divorce roughly around the same time. And I went back to the church I'd fled to at 17, which wasn't UPC anymore. Um, and that was my final exit from the UPC. And that one was less eventful because by that point I wasn't following their rules and had already sort of left once. So, you know, I had this stain on my record. <laughs> when I left, nobody was really surprised. I didn't belong there and I think everybody knew it. I don't have hard feelings. I get it. Life's complicated. And we all make mistakes and mishandle situations. I know I do. And, you know, issues with pastors are awkward and people don't always know how to respond. And if you plan on staying and maintaining good standing, especially in a group that elevates the ministry the way the UPC does, you know, it's probably safest to side with the pastor if your conscience will allow you to shun people because that's just the way it is. So when I finally left, there was gossip and judgment because of my divorce, but I expected that. I mean, small town. And But there were also sweet people that I loved from that church. And I always sat in the back seat with my grandmother and all her little friends. And uh, I loved them. They, they were so good to me. And a lot of them have passed on now, and I really miss them. So to sum up my exit from the UPC and sort of define what moving forward looks like for me, um, you know, it's been a long time at this point. And a healing journey takes time. I had to come to, to a place where I could reconcile uh, the two realities that coexisted. You know, on the one hand, there were several damaging experiences in the UPC that marked me for life. You know, pretty much destroyed my health. And I encountered harsh judgment and what I consider to be false teachings that focused on blind obedience over actually, you know, love for people. Um, and an unhealthy overreach and control. And so that took time to heal from. That didn't happen overnight. So if that's where you're at, give yourself grace to take some time to heal from that. But on the other hand, you know, there were also wonderful, sincere people who I think very highly of to this day. And, you know, I have a lot of sweet memories that'll stay with me for life. I grew up with some pretty great people and had a lot of fun, um, you know, playing ball and traveling around and going to different services and fellowships and events and stuff. And, you know, I'm thankful for that time. And most importantly, my Christian faith began in the UPC. And that is by far the best thing that happened to me there. So there's a few details of my story. So if you enjoyed this video, you can hit like. And if you want YouTube to notify you whenever I post a new one um, and you want to follow my channel, you can just hit subscribe in the notification bell. bell. And you know, if you made it this far, <laughs> thanks for watching.